Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show. Happy Monday. I hope you had a great weekend. It's like a monsoon here in the Northeast. It's just never going to be sunny again. That's how it feels, but we're feeling sunshine in our hearts because it is our son Yates's 14th birthday. You know how that is, right, moms and dads, when your kid hits a birthday and you think back, my God, what was I doing 14 years ago, right? I was both he and I were feeling a lot worse than we do today. I can guarantee you that. But, you know, those are the most magical things. And especially when it's your eldest, right? Like you, you that's the moment. Like you just will never, ever forget that feeling every minute of that morning. It was so long ago, 14 years. Um, he was born in 09. We didn't, ha- I didn't even have a uh, like an iPhone yet. We, we we were taking video off of like a camcorder when we went to the New York City hospital in the early morning. It was like 5 a.m. on my way. Um, so enormous, right? Remember that too? And you're like so incredibly juicy at the end. You feel like Violet Beauregard where if they plucked you with a pin, you would just <laughs> explode. Anyway, I don't miss that piece of it, but um I don't know. It's just an occasion to stop and think about how much your kids mean to you and the passage of time and have you made the most of those 14 years and what's your plan to make make the most of the next four, five that he's with us before he goes off to college. Although I've told my kids many times I don't want them to go to college. I'm trying to infantilize them. I don't want independence and I really don't want them to think they can do anything without mommy. So it's, I'll talk to Dr. Laura about it later. <laughs> All right. A lot happened over the weekend. My God, have you seen the the Menendez story? Senator Menendez? I mean, like, you think if you got away with federal corruption charges, right? Like you actually had to go to federal trial, accused of being corrupt and taking payoffs, and you managed somehow to skate on a hung jury, that you would toe the line. You would be like a little Boy Scout from that point forward. Well, think again because one of the nation's top Democrats is accused by the feds again uh, in a criminal case of taking bribes. Uh, So we'll get to that. And then new polling, my God, my God, the the case for against Senator Menendez is almost as severe as the polls against Joe Biden. Uh, They are terrible and they are leading to a massive freak out on the left. Even the pollster himself, like over uh, ABC News and Washington Post, are like, it's an outlier. It's an outlier. Trump's 10 points up, but it's outlier. Fear not. Is it an outlier? Um, This all comes down a couple days before the second Republican debate as Trump is not only now crushing Joe Biden, but of course, continues to increase his lead over his own GOP rivals. Uh, It is a busy Monday. Joining me now to discuss it all, Charlie Kirk founder and CEO of Turning Point USA and host of The Charlie Kirk Show. Hey, subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is a flash sale alert for EnviroCleanse, the home air purifier so powerful the U.S. Navy chose it to purify the air on their ships. The timing of this 25% off flash sale could not be better. It is officially cold and flu season And now the new COVID strain, whatever, 10,000 is out, right? So it's a good time to purify the air. EnviroCleanse is proven to capture and destroy flu and COVID viruses, for that matter, in your home. Plus, bacteria, toxins, mold, mold is a nightmare, and allergens. EnviroCleanse is a way that you can fight back against the entire family getting sick. In fact, EnviroCleanse is the only home air purifier that promises you and your family better health. Don't miss this 25% off flash sale. Order your EnviroCleanse home air purifier while supplies last. Act now. Visit ekpure.com, ekpure.com. Use the code Megan when you sign up. ekpure.com, code Megan, ekpure.com. Charlie, welcome back to the show. I know you can relate on the child front because I met your beautiful baby daughter at the Turning Point event in July. She's absolutely perfect. But, you know, it's like your child's birthday is almost like a mark, a marking of the passage of time. And like, where were we? And look, what's she doing now? And like, what am I doing? It's almost like a, a gift in many ways. You can do a gut check on whether you're living your life the way you want. 
No, that's right, Megan. I'm going to steal uh, what you said. She's not allowed to grow up. She has to stay at home the rest of her life. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think that's great. Per- permanently infant- infantilize her. But no, it's only been a year, so I can't imagine 13 years from now. Wow, when she turns 14. But congratulations to you. And uh, it's uh, parenthood is the greatest thing ever. So praise God. Aw, thank you. Absolutely right. Praise God is right. We actually, um, he just began his confirmation classes. I'm a, I'm a little behind. He's one year behind. I, I fell down on the job, but he's going with his sister now. So it's like, all sorts of rites of passage coming his way and ours too. Um, okay. Oh, and by the way, I said, what do you want to do today on your birthday? And he, he wants to go see The Nun 2. I'm like, what's that? And oh, we're, we're going to go as a family. Yeah. The Nun 2 is rated R. We have a 10-year-old. I'm like, it's yeah. a no, honey. It's a no. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, I, I've never seen any of the Nun series, but uh, I'm, I'm told it's rather graphic and gory. So that uh, <laughs> that's, that sounds like a 14-year-old boy. So yeah, it's yeah. not it's not happening. There's something called the haunting with it's like an Agatha Christie thing. That's PG thirteen. We might wind up doing that. I'll get back to you. Yeah. Um, speaking of the haunting, Joe Biden's haunted by these poll numbers. My God, did you see the double barrel of the uh, ABC News Washington Post poll and then yep. the NBC News polls? So okay, maybe the ten point Trump lead is an outlier. But now I was listening to Morning Wire today. There have been ten polls matching up Trump versus Biden. Uh, over the past couple of months, I think they said like four show them tied, um, four show Trump up and two show Biden up. But I haven't seen anything that's showing a lead like this. And the the left is having an absolute meltdown because if yes. you look inside these polls and you and I will, all of the data is bad for Joe Biden. It's not like, oh, Biden's really strong. And so it's weird that they came up with a 10 point Trump lead. No, all of the data a job approval, approval on economy, approval on immigration, you go down the list, is absolutely dreadful for the sitting president. What do you make of it all? Several things. Uh, And first of all, I I just, I want to just enjoy it for a second because, (laughs) I mean, here's Donald Trump who's facing 500 years in federal prison. And there's been obviously a scheme hatched against him. And he's stronger than ever, objectively stronger than ever, far stronger than he was in 2020 against Joe Biden. Going back to January, it's very clear the Democrats made a couple predictions uh, for this for this year. They thought that Donald Trump would be in a very bitter and brutal and nasty Republican primary that would make Donald Trump have to constantly be distracted from Nikki Haley to Mike Pence to DeSantis. That has not materialized. There really is not much of a Republican primary. Uh, There's a Republican Party in name, but Trump's not even showing up to the debates. And it's really not much of anything. He's up 40 or 50 points or 30 points in Iowa. And that's the worst state that he's performing in. So the media was wrong about that. And they wanted it badly. They thought they could really damage him and wound him of a general election. The second thing is they went all in on this lawfare strategy. They thought that Donald Trump was going to become deeply unpopular. They wanted to create almost like a wounded animal scenario where Donald Trump was backed into a corner and he had everything against him and he would just become the worst version of himself. Megan, I'll be honest, he's been more disciplined, been more clear than anything I saw towards the latter part of the 2020 election. And so that didn't work at all. Finally, there's a couple other things. I know that this is going to make some people in your audience laugh. The insider who centrally plan everything, they underestimated just how deeply unpopular Joe Biden is and how unpopular he was becoming. Um, And this changed. It was a little bit of a closer race between Trump and Biden back in the spring, but this summer it just fell off a cliff. Um, I mean, this this poll, I'm going to comment on it in a second because even I, as a Trump supporter, I don't even totally believe the poll, and I'm going to tell you what I think is really going on here, but it's alarming every single Democrat pundit. And then another variable that's important to isolate here, Megan, is the rise of third-party candidates that can cause a lot of headaches for Joe Biden and the Democrat Party. A potential no labels campaign, Cornell West is looking strong, and the Green Party is going to be probably on the ballot in a lot of the target states where they were not on the ballot in 2020. Remember in 2016, a lot of Democrats blamed Green Party candidate Jill Stein for robbing the presidency from Hillary Clinton. And if all the Green Party uh, ballots would have went to Hillary Clinton. She would have beat Donald Trump. So you put all these variables together, the people that thought they had a perfect plan for 2023, the plan's not going so well. Now, what do I think is really going on here? Even as a Trump supporter, I would love to believe that Donald Trump is up 10 points or 12 points against Joe Biden. I think that's, I think that's a little bit much, but I think this is just another piece of evidence of the media, pollsters, or people in charge trying to get Joe Biden to not run. 
You saw this with the David Ignatius piece. Uh, Joe Biden should not run for president in the Washington Post. All of a sudden you saw Hunter Biden indictment. You, you're seeing piece after piece, a lot of evidence mount where I think they're trying to send a message to Ron Klain and the really group of eight or 10 people that are white knuckling onto power in the White House. And Megyn Kelly, I'll, uh, Megan, I'll be honest, like I look at what I see right now in front of us, I wanna run against Joe Biden. I wanna run mm -hmm. against you mm -hmm. know, this corrupt, unable to speak, you know, less than desirable president. So that's what I think is going on here. And the people in charge um, are scrambling and they thought they would have Donald Trump in that position. They thought it would be the exact opposite. They thought it would be Trump down 10 points, not Joe Biden down 10 points. Yeah. What's amazing is you're right. It's it's Joe Biden. And Joe Biden is a serious problem for them because even, you know, the, if you look further down the polls, Nikki Haley's being Joe, beating Joe Biden by four or five points too. Um, mm -hmm. Ron DeSantis in at least one of these polls is losing to Joe Biden by two points. But the point is the, Repu the Republicans are doing well and the electorate's looking at the Republicans as a very viable option. And yet you look over on the Dem side, who do they replace him with, Charlie? Who? There's not, you know, like, they're, 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 it, God forbid something would happen to Donald Trump. The GOP would say, he, okay, you know, Ron DeSantis is acceptable. Nikki Haley, clearly they feel is acceptable. Like, they have other choices that they could get behind enthusiastically. Not so over on the Dem side. Yeah, I, I, that's a great point. And also, it's not just going to be a seamless baton transfer, right? Kamala Harris, she's waited her whole life for this, right? She's not just going to, you know, go go to the side for a Gretchen Whitmer or a Gavin Newsom. So they're, they're in a really tough spot here because they basically said, we're not going to have a Democrat primary. Remember, the party of democracy doesn't want to have a Democrat primary. And I, every time I hear democracy, just replace democracy with oligarchy, and it makes total sense. Our oligarchy mm -hmm. is under attack. Our oligarchy has never been in a more fragile spot. Our oligarchy, you know, is falling apart. Makes perfect sense. They don't mean democracy. They mean oligarchy. They mean rule of the few, not of the people. But this is not an easy solution, right? So there's going to be a really heated um, kind of series of meetings that I'm sure we're going to learn about through leaks and through backstabbing of, do we, uh, you know, just anoint Gavin Newsom? Do we make, you know, Vice President Harris the nominee, who, by the way, is even less popular than Joe Biden, which is amazing to think about. And then I, I think the consensus candidate they're going to try to float um, is Gretchen Whitmer. Michelle Obama looks as if she has zero interest whatsoever to do this. Um, I know that name is, you know, rather fashionable to, you know, kind of probe and put out there. But the, the Democrats at this point, they thought that they could control every single one of the variables going into 2024. Think about it. They somewhat did this in 2020. Mass mail-in ballots, constantly having the COVID porn on television with all the, the fear porn, with the um, death counts, the mask mandates, you know, the race riots, and then censoring the Hunter Biden laptop story. They thought they could do this again in 2024. It turns out that what happened in 20 was remarkable. And Molly Ball detailed it in her Time Magazine piece inside the shadow campaign that won the 2020 election when Mark Elias and many others were hosting Zoom calls about potentially having people go in the streets and labor unions and billionaires all coming together. This plan is not going well for them at all. Does that mean that Republicans are going to win? I sure hope so. I, I, I'm not going to make any guarantees because the Democrats still have a far superior political machine in the key mm. states that matter for ballot harvesting, ballot chasing, voter registration, you know, suing uh, to try to relax some of those standards. But for the the people that look as if they can centrally plan everything, they are they're really in panic right now. And quite honestly, I'm enjoying every second of it. Yeah, you will never underestimate the Republicans ability to screw it up. Um, That's it was, correct. I never really get too into the debt fights, you know, and the funding fights, because I mean, I've been at this long enough to realize they always wind up funding it. It's like what they, they take us to the brinksmanship and then it always winds up, they fund it. So it's like, why did I play this game over and over? But I will say right now, Biden's approval numbers on the economy are absolutely dreadful. And if I were a sitting Republican, I wouldn't do anything to, sh to blame shift that over to me. I really wouldn't. I but just politically speaking, I would say fund it. Don't give them one already on NPR this morning. I listen to NPR's up first in the mornings as well. And um, they're already getting ready to like shift the blame. Oh, you know, yep. um, there's been some economic 
headwinds like they're coming our way and this won't help. This won't help. They're going to you know, like, so don't underestimate the Republicans ability to screw these things up. OK, but let's get into the numbers on this poll. Let's start with the overall approval rating for Joe Biden. Uh, NBC News pointing out over the weekend, these are the lowest of his presidency. Uh, disapproval of Joe Biden, this is the NBC poll, 56% approval, 41. The ABC News, Washington Post poll, even worse, disapproval's the same, 56. They're both getting a 56% disapproval. They say approval at 37. Uh, on the economy, sticking with the ABC, disapproval of 64%. So you've got two thirds of the electorate who are very unhappy about how the economy's doing. Um, the border, 62%, again, almost two thirds, disapprove of what's happening at the Southern border. They're angry about it. They they see what we're yes. seeing. No, like, so none of what the Democrats are doing for once is working. Like usually they send out their talking points to the media. The media says, Biden, Bidenomics, Bidenomics. And then the opinions start to turn on the economy. Oh, maybe Bidenomics is a good thing. Or, you know, same thing about the Southern border. Neither one is working. Mm -hmm. Huge swaths of the electorate are deeply unhappy about both of those two things. Yes, I mean, this reminds me of the Pravda newspapers in the Soviet Union where they say, there's no famine, everything's great. And the people in the countryside are like, no, we have, we have no food. I mean, you, you could keep on telling us that you know, there's bountiful harvest, but we have no food and things are really bad. And you look at those two issues in particular, the immigration one, what two different realities that we're living in. I was just in Texas and I was speaking to ranchers and people on the front lines. This is a crisis. I mean, we are seeing the planned and co-sponsored collapse of Western civilization. We're talking about eight to 10,000 people a day. I mean, in New York City alone, it, it is putting stress on um, public services and on schools and housing, and it's happening in almost every major urban pocket of the country. And Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, it seems as if they almost want it. I mean, they are almost empowering DHS and Border Patrol to continue the invasion into America. And then the economy is that inflation persists. The economy is not good at all whatsoever. I mean, and you read these uh, uh, disapproval approval ratings, 41% of Americans approve of Joe Biden. Like, who are these people? How could you approve of this guy? He's doing nothing well, nothing. I mean, whether it be the national debt, the southern border, um, what's going on in Ukraine, that's not going well at all. And it does go to show that there is going to be 35 to 40 percent of the country that will never waver from any sort of left wing Democrat type politics. But the Democrats are now coming up against a reality crisis, which is how much can you actually spin? How much can you actually lie to the American people when the entire society itself is collapsing? And that's what we're living through. This is not just a regular presidential election coming into 2024. We did not get over COVID and the lockdowns, Megan. Instead, we have only kind of rolled one crisis into the other. And we, we still have almost all these underlying issues of young people that are killing themselves, young people that can't find work. And by the way, in the polling, you see some remarkable figures of 18 to 35 year old voters that I, I'm sure we'll get to, which is that almost every possible demographic, including minority voters, are rejecting the Democrat regime. They're saying, can we get back to some form of a normal America? Can, can we stop the nonstop panic of 10,000 people coming across the country and medically mutilating 13 year olds and teaching pornography in our textbooks? And it is this almost, I mean, Krista Rufo has isolated this, I think, beautifully. We are living through a hysterical cultural revolution. And even the people that aren't necessarily conservative or Republican, they want a way to make it stop. And Joe Biden was supposed to be that person, Megan. He was the, I'm going to get us back to 1984 America where we agree to disagree and we're going to calm down the tensions. His appeal, if there was one in 2020, which is hard to believe, is that I'm going to be the kind of you know, jovial grandfather type figure, and we're gonna get, and we're gonna stop all of the heightened alarmism. It's been the opposite. He has accelerated that sort of panic, and the American people are ready to go back to a country that is orderly and stable. Not to mention the crime issue, which is hurting people every single day. Who the hell said we wanted an influx of over 10 million illegals coming into the <laughs> America? Who the hell voted for that? Like, even even my radical Dem friends on the Upper West Side of yes. Manhattan are not in favor of that. And even the governor of New York, Kathy Hochul, a Dem, mm -hmm. who's got her vaccinated necklace on wherever she goes, just so you're clear on her politics. Um, 
she's out saying they've got to go someplace else. They, they get rid of them. They got to go. So, I mean, all of this is reflected now in this polls, because if you have 62 percent of the electorate saying we disapprove of how he's handling the southern border, that's not just Republicans and right leaners. That's Democrats, too. Some large percentage. I want to go through some of the numbers before we and I want to go through specifics here because there's just so much in here. So 59 percent. This is I'm on the NBC News poll here. 59% say they want new options besides Joe Biden. NBC News pointing out yesterday, this is not normal. That is not normal for a sitting president, an incumbent, to have this many wanting a change on the ticket. It, when Trump was at this point in his uh, election, it was just 37% of Republicans wanted a new option. It's 59% who want a change for Joe Biden. And let's not forget, Donald Trump lost when just 39% wanted a change. So you've got, you know, almost almost 60% want him gone. Like, that's a terrible number for him. The Democrats can smell, and so can the Republicans, blood in the water if they stick with this yes. guy. And that's not even factoring in his age, which is an enormous issue, okay? NBC News still, 74%, 74 of the electorate has major or moderate concerns that Joe Biden does not have the necessary mental and physical health to be president for a second term. That's enormous. I mean, th like then you look over, okay, maybe that, maybe that's an outliner, 74% according to NBC. What did ABC and Washington Post find? 74% say Biden's too old for a second term. That's up 6% since just May, 62% of Democrats, I said in 59% in the NBC poll said we want somebody else. 59 Democrats, 59% Democrats. Yep. In the ABC poll, 62% of Democrats and Democrat leaners say the party should pick someone other than Joe Biden. Just 33% of Democrats and Democrat leaners want Joe Biden. My God, he's too old. They don't want him. They don't think he can do a second term. At a minimum, a minimum, best case scenario for them, this is gonna severely decrease turnout and depress the enthusiasm for their guy. That's right. And then you have Cornell West, who is rather talented. He's a smooth talking guy who might be able to get three to five percent in some of these states. Remember that there is this forced marriage all around stopping Donald Trump between the Bernie Sanders base and kind of the more of the suburban corporate Democrats. And Bernie Sanders has a really good argument to say that he won the Democrat nomination in 2016 and it was taken from him from Hillary Clinton. And he would have won it in 2020 if it wasn't for COVID. And all of a sudden, Joe Biden, who finished six in New Hampshire, they kind of reset the entire process. And Joe Biden gets uh, endorsed by Clyburn in South Carolina, and he just kind of all of a sudden became the nominee. So the base of the Democrat Party is very radical. They tend to want some of the most extreme positions, and they don't look at Joe Biden favorably, especially from an age mindset, and they're ready to defect. So this kind of forced marriage that has happened between the Bernie Sanders, AOC, Rashida Tlaib, Elon Omar, Ayanna Pressley wing of the Democrat Party, and your more kind of transactional, transactional Democrats like Joe Biden and Bob Menendez and many others, where they're just there for power and they're there for just kind of maintaining the oligarchy, that can work if everything is about opposing Donald Trump. And I've said that Donald Trump is a far better criticizing type candidate than an incumbent. He's just better at being an outsider. He is he's better at challenging Joe Biden, at pointing, poking holes in what's happening. As an incumbent, it was a lot harder because he had to govern the country in the midst of a crisis we've never seen before, multiple crises, by the way, and then also run for reelection. What they did in 2020 by removing the Green Party from being on the ballot in the key states is they created almost a European style vote of no confidence against Donald Trump. And it was barely, barely decisive in Joe Biden's direction. We're talking about like 10,000 votes in Arizona, 9,000 votes in Georgia, and 22,000 votes in Wisconsin. That's on the margins of the margins with Republicans doing almost nothing when it came to chasing ballots and engaging in early voting. And that's changing, Megan. I got to tell you, talking to the grassroots, what we're doing at Turning Point Action, you know, talking to precinct committeemen, talking to county chairmen, all in on early voting. That is going to make a difference. So the Democrats Good. kind of machinery edge is closing. They're still far superior, right? They spend more money. They know how to ballot chase. They know how to micro target. That might be able, might have been able to get them a 200,000 vote makeup in Arizona. Now it will probably be a 50,000 makeup 
right? So we're talking about closing the window on the strategic advantage for where the Democrats were, be, where they were all, all of a sudden able to make John Fetterman a U.S. senator against a very qualified and impressive Dr. Oz, which just made us all so confused. Their, so their machine is not going to be able to produce the same sort of um, results that it did in 2020 and 22 because Republicans are finally waking up to that. And then they have a deeply unpopular candidate as it stands now. And then third party candidates that could splinter younger voters and minority voters. I'm not sure how they're going to solve this. And I, I believe that there is going to be a movement afoot to try to replace Joe Biden. But the, the drama yeah. that the media just doesn't cover, Megan, is that Joe Biden is white knuckling. He doesn't want to give it up. Jill, Joe, Ron Klain, Karine Jean-Pierre, there is a group of White House insiders that are saying no to any David Ignatius or NBC. They say, nope, we're not giving up power. We're not giving up power. That's that's pretty dramatic. It's uh, it's really I mean, interesting great, to witness. Great because uh, he's very beatable and he's you know supporting yes. the mutilation of children uh, in, in in terms of their you know th these 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 puberty blockers and to cross gen gender hormones and then uh, you know the the sex change procedures when they're under eighteen. And even like the 15 year olds who are saying that they want this, like Chloe Cole, who then lived to reject it or you know regret it, like there's they get they ignore these people anyway. I, as I've said before, I'm really becoming a single issue voter on on that particular thing. But let me give you some other numbers. Um, would you say this is a, uh, ABC? Would you say you were better off financially than you were when Biden became president? Not as well off, or about in a, about in the same shape. 44 percent say I'm not as well off. Almost half of the electorate says I am worse off economically than I was when Joe Biden took president. This or took the presidency. This, as they now are looking back, according to the same polls, more favorably on the Trump presidency. They're, so Trump's numbers are going up in terms of like, well, how how is the country? How is the economy? How is I under President Trump versus how am I under, under President Biden? So they're having sort of buyer's remorse on Biden. And then as always happens when you have a breakup, you know, they're remembering all the good things about Trump and maybe not some of the things that they didn't love about him. Either way, it's creating a rosy glow around him, notwithstanding any of the indictments. The news on the indictments, uh, this is back to NBC. Uh, okay, 62% have major or moderate concerns about Trump facing different criminal and civil trials for alleged wrongdoing. But that is 12 points under the number who have concerns about Biden's mental health and physical health. Uh, and 60% on the Joe Biden side have major or moderate concerns that Joe Biden was possibly aware or involved in Hunter's business dealings. So the whole Hunter thing and the Joe Biden age and infirmity thing has completely crossed out the Trump legal yes. indictments. The, the Democrats amazing. tried their best, but it failed. Well, and I just, you know, I was watching Morning Mika and they can't understand why people aren't so fired up about the indictments. It's like, how about you go talk to the country that you supposedly, you know, communicate to every single day? And the answer is this, people think that it's way overreaching. And it would be one thing, Megan, if it was like one indictment here, but when you have New York, Atlanta, Fulton County, and then two from Jack Smith, it's so obviously targeted. Let's not bury the lead. This is a guy who is facing 500 years in federal prison. And according to all the legacy news media is beating the incumbent president by 10 points. That alone is just remarkable. I mean, it would be remarkable if he was tied and he's up allegedly 10 points, which I still find, you know, just amazing to see. And it goes to show a couple of things. Number one, Donald Trump's resiliency is noteworthy. You could love him, you could hate him, the fact with everything still being thrown against him that he continues to press onward and forward, I think just to be virtuous and admirable, it's, it's incredible. But the American people, they do not trust these institutions. And that is where the disconnect is, is that the plan that was hatched here in 2023 by a lot of these Democrat consultants and insiders and, and those sorts of people, they thought that if you are indicted, it changes the entire game that, oh my goodness, people are really going to walk away from him now and it's going to, you know, muddy him up. And that's kind of the running joke we have. How else are they going to bring down Donald Trump's favorables from now till next November? I mean, 
I, I get it. He 500 years in federal prison. What else do they have on him potentially? The guy has been impeached twice. You had the Billy Bush tape. You have every possible person around him leaking and writing books about him. What I'm getting at is that his floor is bulletproof. Is that yeah. he really can't go any lower. He has nothing but upside. And people are now willing to say, okay, don't love the indictment thing, but I was richer. We had a border. We weren't funding yeah. a proxy war in Ukraine. He, you know, the very basic things like law and order were respected. Give me the guy with the indictments and the tweets that I might not love. It's better than bedlam, chaos, and dementia. I don't have to get married to Donald Trump, but if I put Donald Trump back in the Oval Office, people are thinking, my life is gonna get better. I understand that. Yes. I mean, the southern border alone, if you're paying even just a little attention, you cannot avoid what is happening, and that's happening mostly in blue cities now. The people down in the red cities along the southern border, it's already been factored in. They're well aware of what's been going on. But now the blue cities are having to deal with it firsthand. And, and the same way COVID made a lot of more moderates and even Republicans out of these Dems, the, the immigration influx is doing the same. You, you don't send your kid to school and have him wait outside for two hours just to get in and then have him uh, have to you know say his pronouns as he you know waits in line to get a book, as he has to sit through a class in which the instructions are now in Spanish and in you mm -hmm. know Swahili and all the rules that we went through this in New York, where you actually have to have a translator for every language that's represented and say, I'm still gonna vote for these people. I'm still gonna vote for the power, the, the, the powers in charge. Let's talk about the young voters because you pointed this out in the ABC News Washington Post poll among 18 to 35 year olds, Trump has a 53 to 38 advantage. That's unbelievable. In NBC, he still, Biden still has the advantage with 18 to 34 year olds, but in the ABC, it's advantaged Trump and by a lot. And among Hispanics, I saw you pointing this out, Trump's edge, according to the ABC poll, is 50 to 44. So he's making inroads with black voters. He's making huge inroads with Hispanic voters. And he's making inroads with the young people, Charlie. You know, I'm, I'm just you. gonna take that's, a look. By the way, I think you delivered that. Thank you. Well, that's that's very kind. And it's our team at Turning Point. You see how hard they work, Megan, and they're just the best. And, you know, 11 years ago, I was told that millennials, which is in, is included in that poll and soon to be Gen Z, they're going to be permanently liberal, permanently progressive. Don't waste your time. And and we got to work, you know, started thousands of college and high school campus chapters. We have tens of thousands of amazing leaders and we reach millions of people on digital and social media every single day. So, to see the results of that poll is very promising. It's the, the margin is surprising, but it's not that surprising because I've been telling people for a while, especially the late 20 somethings and early 30 somethings, that there is a voting block that can move 20 to 30 points, which is they're four or five years removed from college. They lived the lockdowns and they missed an opportunity to buy any property and they are renting their way into their mid 30s. And that creates a lot of rage, Megan, because that is always part of the American experience and the American dream. Buying property, seeing your wealth go up. And so you have these late 20-something and early 30-somethings that are living paycheck to paycheck. They still have sizable student loan debt because they were told to go to these universities. They are not seeing their wages be able to maintain with inflation. So they have credit card debt and medical debt and all sorts of other, they don't even have money for an emergency. And then on top of it, they cannot buy a home and they keep on being told by baby boomers, you know, yeah, the American dream. And we were able to buy a home at your age and it creates very angry voters. And they, and that is their number one issue, property ownership and wealth accumulation for early 30 somethings. They feel the game is rigged against them, even more so than abortion. Abortion is what animates the 18 to 22 year old crowd because they're at, you know, they're in Narnia, they're, they, you know, free sex and abortion and all that. And we're doing our best to try to message them, especially with the young ladies. But when the, let's say, pesky shackles of reality start to come forward for a 31-year-old voter in Atlanta or in Phoenix, where inflation is 22% over the last 18 months, and they mm. see their rent go up from $2,300 a month to $3,800 a month or $4,200 a month, they want to change in leadership badly. 
because they feel as if they have been priced out of the American dream and they did everything they were told. Think about it. Go to college and get the piece of paper, wear the mask, lock down, you know, do all these different things. They have been a rule following generation. And all of a sudden they see it. It was all a scam. It was all a lie. And they're poor because of it. And they are pissed. I'm telling you, in the 2024 election, early 30, early, early 30 somethings can go red in a way that would blow up every single Democrat model. This is just, our audience probably knows this, but this is how Charlie spends his days. I mean, immersed in these very crowds, talking to them about their issues, Dem and Republican alike. He's trying yes. to convince them to vote red, but th like, you know of what you speak because this is literally how you make your living. Um, th on top of everything you just said, his age. <laughs> mm -hmm. What young, vibrant person, up and coming in their 20s or their young 30s, would look at Joe Biden and say, yeah, sure. He can do it. Every day, there's another fall down moment. Every day he screws up his words, yep. he stumbles, he literally falls down. I realize Trump is only three and a half years younger than Biden, but uh, there's no comparison. I just spent an hour and a half with a former president. There's no comparison. Um, and, so, and they know that no matter what, if these Democrats wanna say outwardly and the media wants to say he's, he's up to the job, oh, we can barely keep up, to, up with him as Kareem jean -Pierre. That's fine. You can say it all you want. No one's buying it. And these young people realize like he can't do it. So what are we going to get? We're going to get her. So that leads me to Kamala Harris. Right, let me squeeze in a quick break and I'm going to pick it up with Kamala Harris sure. and what they're now saying about her, what the polls are saying about her uh, and what Joe Biden said about blacks and Hispanics. You stand by, <laughs> stand by yet another gaffe, two of them. This show is supported by Grand Canyon University. Founded in 1949, GCU is a private Christian university that's dedicated to delivering an affordable and transformative higher education. Their vibrant campus is located in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. And according to niche.com, it's ranked a top 25 best campus in the country. As of June, 2023, GCU offers 330 academic programs with over 270 of them online allowing you the freedom to earn your degree on your time from wherever you are. Their programs are also designed to challenge and inspire you. At GCU, your degree, whether it's a bachelor's, master's, or doctorate, integrates the free market system and a welcoming Christian worldview. And they believe that higher education should be accessible to all. Learn more about GCU's programs, competitive tuition rates, and scholarship offers from your university counselor. They are part of the supportive graduation team who take a personalized approach to helping you achieve your academic goals, walking alongside you every step of the way. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University, private, Christian, affordable. For more information or to enroll, visit gcu.edu. So we've seen a series of events where these Democrats go on the Sunday shows, which are usually friendly to the Dems, and refuse to say Kamala Harris is the best choice for his VP, for his running mate, et cetera. Pick your form of that question. And th they don't wanna say it. You know, Nancy Pelosi didn't wanna say it. Jamie Raskin didn't wanna say it. And the latest is James Clyburn, who basically got Joe Biden the nomination last time around. He was flailing. Uh, he's from South Carolina and he helped uh, get Joe Biden the nomination. Joe Biden had to promise he was going to have a female black running mate that wound up being Kamala Harris. He gets asked about Kamala Harris on the Sunday shows about whether she's the best choice and did not stick the landing. Watch. I see her as a part of that future. Absolutely. Is I she see her. the future, though? Oh, she could very well be. And I look to her uh, as a, a successor uh, to this president. Uh, but I also know the history of that as well. Uh, it's not a given. She'll have to compete uh, going forward with whoever may have dreams and aspirations. And I think she will acquit herself well. Why do you think she's not resonating more with voters? What do you think the issue is? Uh, because when you compare the first uh, woman of color and first woman uh, to be vice president of the United States and compare that to all of the history before, you will get that. Okay. <laughs> She's not doing better because we're racist and we're sexist. Yes, yeah, yeah. Even yeah, though, yeah, right. yeah. if you look at the if you look at the NBC poll, which Kristen Welker was asking him about, um, it shows 
that actually the people who are least enthusiastic about voting for Biden-Harris are blacks and Latinos. <laughs> they're the least enthusiastic. So I guess they're also racist against Kamala Harris. Yeah, I mean, then how did Obama win? I mean, if America is such a racist country and you had the first black you know, person running for the presidency, no, people don't like Kamala Harris because she's a terrible person and she's an awful politician. <laughs> she's not even good at it. The cackling thing, she has not been able to get that out of her kind oh. of standard operating procedure. And it, it just, she says the goofiest, weirdest stuff. You know, I always joke around that if they replace Joe Biden and we get to run against Kamala Harris, I mean, it's an even more unpopular version of Hillary Clinton. I mean, at least Hillary Clinton had some sort of ability to like raise a ton of money and make her political opponents just vanish and disappear. I mean, Kamala Harris has none of that. I mean, she just kind of just got appointed because of, she's an affirmative action pick. Let's just call it exactly what it is. Yeah, I mean, Clyburn said, said that so. we need somebody. Yeah, we need somebody in this criteria. And look, affirmative action is destroying America. It's destroying America in college campuses. Thankfully, the Supreme Court overturned it, but campuses are finding ways around it. And then you get Kamala Harris, and she was appointed and tasked with one of the greatest liabilities for the Biden regime, and that is the border. If she were to run, I'm telling you, especially in the swing state of Arizona, she will just get steamrolled on this issue. This is an issue. If you talk about an issue where 60 to 70% of Americans are upset about it and it's not going to change and where the Biden regime refuses to do anything because their vision is to open the borders to the entire third world, it is the border. And it was Kamala Harris who was tasked with overseeing the entire thing. And so look, the Democrats, they don't know who to choose next. And hilariously, we were always told Democrats have a great bench. We have a great bench. We have Gavin Newsom. We have the Castro brothers. We have Gretchen Whitmer. And what are they going to bring next? J.B. Pritzker? I mean, like that, mm -hmm. at, at this point, it's who Who else are they going to try to put into Menendez? this? You know, <laughs> uh, why not? I mean- Since indictments I, tend I, to help, I, their, their calculation could be. Yeah, We've got that, an that's indicted right. guy. If indictments boost you in the polls, then uh, Menendez <laughs> is the guy. So listen to this. Here's Joe Biden, obviously seeing the lack of enthusiasm with minority groups, which tends to be the Democrats' bread and butter. They, they need black voters to turn out for Joe Biden, and they need those numbers that we just went over with Hispanics to reverse themselves, ASAP. So Joe Biden goes and he uh, addresses the Hispanic caucus, um, and he, he gets them confused. Now, imagine if Donald Trump confused um, the Hispanics for the blacks which is what happened, listen to SOT1. My dad used to say, everyone, everyone is entitled to be treated with dignity and respect. The Congressional Black Caucus embodies all those values. <laughs> Except you're talking to the Hispanic Caucus. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That but, 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 but look, white liberal Democrats view them as all the same, which is just obedient minority voters that keep us in power and what, what's the big difference? I mean, look, look, and let's just understand why are Hispanics starting to go more to the right? And I think it's the trans issue, Megan. I think of all the issues that the faith, family, freedom base of Hispanic America find repulsive, it's this idea that men can give birth. Spending time mm -hmm. in Hispanic communities. I, I grew up in one. I grew up in a high school that was 53% English as a second language. There is this kind of preservation of traditional gender roles of that there and even beyond that there is that we're going to have strong men and we are going to have strong women and like this kind of machismo undercurrent in hispanic culture this idea that men can give birth you have an you have someone that comes from honduras legally or from mexico that's been here for two generations they think that's insane it and someone from the Upper West Side, you know, those friends that you mentioned that are trying to almost imperialize these values and colonize these communities, they, they don't want anything to do with it. Secondly, Hispanics, they want a border. I know this is kind of a crazy thing that Joe Biden and white liberals don't understand because they don't want a border while they live in gated communities. But you know who is seeing an uptick in crime? Carjackings, rape, arson, murder, strain on social services is legal working class Hispanics in the West Valley of Phoenix in Glendale, is working class Hispanics in Harris County in Houston, and not to mention the late term abortion stuff they don't like at all. And so you put all this together, white liberalism 
is at odds with traditional Hispanic values. And you're starting to see that manifest in the polls. It could be, Megan, it could be that Donald Trump wins the Hispanic vote in 2024. If that happens, you will see a political realignment that could put the Democrat Party into the minority for generations to come. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be Catholic, Catholics like me. We don't believe in any of that stuff. Um, The other issue with Joe Biden that I'm sorry, but again, imagine if this were Donald Trump. Imagine if this were Donald Trump. He's at, he's, now he was addressing the Congressional Black Caucus. Okay, this, this time he actually was in front of the Congressional Black Caucus. They're Phoenix Awards, they're called, on Saturday. And he was trying to make a reference to LL Cool J. Two gaffes in here. See if our listening audience can hear both of them. The two of the great artists of our time representing the groundbreaking legacy of hip hop in America, LLJ Cool J. Uh, <laughs> by the way, that boy's got, he got, that man's got biceps bigger than my thighs. I think he's been. Oh my God, I'm cringing. I'm dying. I'm dying. He called him boy. He called a black man boy. It's not the first time and it won't be the last. He's done it repeatedly. I could play you all. In fact, we should get a butted soundbite together, you guys. We'll play it tomorrow. Of all the number of times that Joe Biden has done this. And then, yep. of course, doesn't even know who LL, J. Cool. Like, I, I, okay, what do you make of it? I just think that we should just play the corn pop tape on repeat where Joe Biden, you know, just goes over this whole thing when he was young and there was this guy, Corn Pop. And, but by the way, what is it with this just nonstop Joe Biden yelling at the sky? There there, there is no kind of change in his decibel level. It's just full out. And then there was a guy, cool, L-J-L-L, boy. (laughs) It's just, there, 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 there is no nuance here. And there's, there's no volume control. And I'm going to say something like really mean, but like, when I'm around people in their 80s or 90s and they've lost like their sense of anything around them, like there's, it's just full like blast of like noise is what it is. It's just yeah. projection of noise. And <laughs> look, we can make fun of it, but yeah, this guy is in charge of the nuclear football. He's in charge of yeah. our border. And yeah, I just like, is there an indoor voice you could use, Joe Biden? Like a little bit? Like <laughs> he's got the whisper. You have a microphone. Every once in a while. <laughs> but then you're so Ricky, like, the mere fact that he continues to refer to black people as boy, black men, grown, accomplished, billionaire, millionaire, black men as boy, yes. that boy, that boy. My God, it's showing like he is, a, he's of a certain age and they know it. And then they're like, why, why isn't there black enthusiasm? Maybe it's because this huge pattern, you want us to credit you for being the most woke, diverse, you know, but we can see how you think and talk about black people because your filter has gone away now that you're 200. That's that's exact. That's right. Yes. And wokeism, when it comes to how it relates to the black community, is white liberal academic ideas from Harvard, Princeton, and Yale that seek to control black America. And the more we can get that message out, these are abstract, weird, postmodernist, unproven fringe ideologies that started in the 1960s by Herbert Marcuse, Michel Foucault, and Jacques Derrida that are then being put towards black America so that they can be controlled for political purposes. It's not about liberation. It's not about empowerment. It's not about rebuilding these sort of communities. It's about, it's a repurposing of the same thing that happened in the 1860s or early 1900s, which is white Democrats controlling the black communities. I think we're starting to see black America wake up to it. That's my hope. That's my prayer. And um, time will tell. Well, may- maybe L Cool J K will help <laughs> people see. Maybe he's offended enough. He will join the Candace Owens uh, revolution, uh, the Blexit, Blexit, and say, We've had enough of this. That's right. About it. It's better not enough. There's so much to go over. We're going to pick up the issue of immigration. We're going to talk about how Pete Buttigieg completely dropped the messaging on this. Hillary Clinton out there talking about how it's very disturbing to hear these politicians tell lies with impunity. (laughs) And then we'll get to Bob Menendez, New Jersey's finest, uh, and the gold bars found in his home. It's what a news day. Stay tuned. Charlie Kirk is with us the whole show. Don't forget, you can find The Megan Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east and the full video show and clips by subscribing to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Megan Kelly. 
audio podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. Check it out. Like many people, I'm trying to eat healthier these days, and that is why I love good olive oil. And by good, I mean fresh. Olive oil packs the most flavor and healthiest nutrients when it's fresh from the farm. And that is the problem with supermarket olive oils. They're not fresh. They can sit on the shelf for many months, growing stale. That is why I like my olive oil direct from small, award-winning farms, thanks to a guy named TJ Robinson, also known as the olive oil hunter. When I first tasted this guy's farm fresh oils, I fell in love with them. They're absolutely delicious. The flavors are vibrant. They're kind of grassy, like in a good way. They're delicious. They're perfect for salads, for veggies, pasta, meat, fish, you name it. And as an intro to TJ's Fresh Pressed Olive Oil Club, TJ's willing to send you a full-size $39 bottle of one of the world's finest artisanal olive oils for just $1 to help him cover shipping. Best of all, there's never a commitment to buy anything, and you can cancel your membership at any time. Get your free $39 bottle for just $1 in shipping and taste the difference freshness makes. Go to harvestfreshnow.com, harvestfreshnow.com for a free bottle and pay just $1 in shipping at harvestfreshnow.com. Just FYI, you know, I remember when I was in college and law school, there was nothing like this. You know, like there might have been like a college Republican club, but like nobody went and it was not well publicized. There was no large, strong organization saying, it's okay to be over here. You know, there are millions of us. Mm-hmm. You're not alone. You know, all you That's had right. back in my day was like this uniform reinforced message that if you wanted to get ahead in life, if you wanted good grades, if you wanted your professors to like you, you had to be a lefty and you had to repeat the lefty talking points. Yep. So, I mean, I just love this organization. It's just a reminder. And I've, I've spoken to young people in it myself at your events and elsewhere who are, for once, they just feel like they have other people who are their age, who feel the way they do about a lot of these issues instead of feel, feeling completely untethered, judged and ostracized. God bless you for what you do, Charlie Kirk. Thank um, you, Megan. Okay. Thank you. So here we go uh, on the subject. I don't want to leave just the unelectability problem that Joe Biden's facing right now because there's one other point I wanted to make on it, and that is the voters see it, and like we've seen this White House do repeatedly when their agenda is failing, they blame it on messaging. You see, the problem is like we just need to do a better job of showing people how amazing we are, of like reminding them how everything that's good in their lives is from us. Here's just a taste of that as Biden's campaign manager was um, asked some questions on CBS the other day. Watch. I think he's too old to be president right now. Like, he doesn't know what's going on right now. I see him diminishing as far as his energy and the public life. I mean, it's like he had to drink a monster drink or something just to stay awake. You know what I mean? Like, he's really just very tired, and the job is arduous. So, I mean, you need someone with a little more energy level. I think he needs to be in front of voters to show that he's not the sort of doddering old man that the Republicans are trying to make him out to be. What do you make of all that? Well, you know, I think that it's important we continue to show the work that the president's doing day in and day out. Um, The most recent trip that he took overseas to the G20, I think it's a perfect example of, um, you know, the kind of schedule that he continues to keep. They're dead. They're dead. If that's that's their plan and that's oh, their their goodness. woman in charge of the plan, yeah. they're dead. So, I mean, look, I, I've been on Air Force One and I could tell you that it, it's not a challenge to fly an Air Force One <laughs> anywhere, okay? So, I mean, it, it's beyond first class. It's beyond flying private. You got, you know, people on your own, you know, anything you need, little appetizers, whatever, not to mention entire quarters for the president. That's their re-election pitch. Hey, the president flew on Air Force One to Asia, okay? Give us four more years. That, that's yeah. the pitch. No, th- this is, first of all, I just want to reemphasize this point. Th- there's, there's something brewing here, Megan, and there's a lot of people that want to see Joe Biden removed at the top level of the Democrat Party. That was, they could have thrown away those sound bites at CBS News. I mean, come on, CBS News is not a news organization. They're a Democrat super PAC that happens to have time on, you know, the network schedule. But yet we see this on CNN now. CNN last week, or week and a half ago, they aired this two-minute thing of all of Joe Biden's lies over yeah. the last five to seven years. Like, what? 
Like who asked you, CNN, to all of a sudden become a news network? No, there is somebody pushing behind the scenes. It could be Valerie Jarrett. It could be Barack Obama. It could be Lorene Powell Jobs. It could be the Democrat donors of Reid Hoffman or Alexander Soros. We don't know, but there is certainly a, let's just say a war room that has been developed somewhere that is are lobbying these networks that are starting to call shots and they're trying to get Joe Biden to step out of the way. And they're always going to say it's the messaging. Why do they have to say that? Because they will never actually admit that the policies themselves, their ideas are a cancer to the American Republic. It's just, we have to message it better. You know, we have to try to convince working class people or any person that 10 million illegals is a good thing and it is a stimulus <laughs> to your nation. We just have to message them that, you know, double digit inflation is, is a great thing. And that goes to show that they think their plan is just to own the media narrative and the airwaves. But the second part of this is to shut up the people that dare criticize them, is call them disinformation artists, kick them off of social media, you know, try to suppress the flow of information. And thankfully, Megan, thanks to shows like yours and our podcast, that we don't have to rely on the main networks to get our message out anymore, is that the main networks, no matter how much they try to spin for the regime, they've lost significant power since 2020. Mm hmm. Yeah, thank God. Well, I, I mean, that that requires me to play the Hillary Clinton soundbite where I have to tell you, she is a top Democrat is deeply, deeply concerned about liars in politics. Charlie, deeply concerned. Check it out. The mm. only way we're going to get through this, Jen, is by defeating them. You know, people say to me all the time, well, what can we do? And I say, well, you can vote. Mm -hmm. And they go, well, what else? I said, that's the most important thing. <laughs> that's the one. That's it. You get up there and you vote mm -hmm. and you vote for people who actually want to get things done and don't traffic in lies and falsehoods and hatred and divisiveness. That's what you can do to help our country. Don't traffic in lies. Mm. Vote for somebody who doesn't traffic in yeah. lies. I mean, like like this yeah. president who says the border is secure, whose administration is telling us the border is secure, like her? <laughs> like her, who says that the, there was nothing in the emails and that was a non-story and nothing happened in Benghazi either. And I mean, we could go down the list. If there was a word I would never use as a Clinton, it's traffic. Let's just put it that way, given mm -hmm. what Bill Clinton may or may not have done with Jeffrey Epstein. Anyway, putting that aside, uh, let's not bury the lead. They're, they're launching a whole new Clinton global initiative, right? So, I mean, the, the, the band is getting back together, right? Let's go mm -hmm. raise all this charitable money. I know it sounds wild. Don't be surprised if Hillary Clinton tries to weasel her way back into the presidential type conversation. Her entire life since Wellesley College has been about her becoming president of the United States, including her marriage with Bill Clinton. But yeah, I mean, how is dodging <laughs> sniper fire, Hillary, in Iraq? How is yeah. that one? Or how about the uh, bleach bidding emails? What, with a cloth? Or yes, of course, the Benghazi stuff. Hillary Clinton doesn't just lie for a living, she maneuvers the entire political landscape in the most Machiavellian way of any person we have seen in the last 40 or 50 years. It is power for power's sake, the ends justify the means. And qu quite honestly, if that's the best the Democrats have right now, is deploying Hillary Clinton, lecturing us about lying while she's gonna go raise another couple hundred million dollars to make it vaporize and disappear in a third world country, I feel pretty good about our chances. It's not gonna be Hillary. I, I agree with you more and more. It doesn't seem like it's gonna be Joe. It's not gonna be Hillary. Maybe it's gonna be Pete Buttigieg. They fell in love with him last time around. He's now in a very important role, Secretary of Transportation. And he was out there and asked over the weekend about this massive immigration problem where we are now at record levels of 10,000 illegals coming over the border a mm -hmm. day, a, a day. day. Uh, and so let's see how he handled it. Was the Biden administration caught off guard by this latest surge of migrants? Well, what you saw was the administration, as always, responding as needed to conditions, being uh, proactive where necessary. Were you and, caught off guard, though? Uh, look, uh, the, the president did what needed to be done. And uh, often that involves a rapid response, like the rapid response that this administration directed. Uh, but also what we see is a political dynamic where some people seem to prefer that the problem continue uh, rather than to do something to actually solve it. Yes, and that person is your boss. I am convinced he is chat GPT. I'm convinced. <laughs> like there's nothing you could tell me otherwise. It's as if I was just, please answer as if it, it was like programmed. And I wrote this down. Conditions to proactively, 
have a rapid, no one talks like this, Megan. No one. I, I don't care who you are. <laughs> he, he, he wasn't even saying anything. Well, you have to have it's the true. conditions to proactively have a rapid response. Like, hello? <laughs> like, it's, like, is there anything there that isn't like some sort of like robotic out of it. like automaton? And it's just like my programming does not allow me to answer the question. But we have conditions to proactively have a rapid response. Yeah, that, that, I'm, I've, I've, I've never heard anybody in any leadership position not speak like that unless I'm trying to get an answer from an artificial intelligence chat box. Or from Kamala Harris, who does do that often. But yeah, she's a, she's a different version. So on the border, the situation, I and mean, we're, we're joking because it's laugh or cry, but I mean, it truly is dire. It's dire. And I, I feel for these families who are dealing with it. I agree with the plan from some of these Southern state governors to, to bus them north to the sanctuary cities and west out to California so that they have to deal with it. But it's not just those those Republican governors. The, the sitting president is busing the migrants to places like New York uh, and elsewhere. So like they're being bused to places that need to feel the pain in order to change public sentiment on this issue. Uh, Griff Jenkins was down there for Fox News on the southern border over the weekend. He posted this on Saturday. He's doing a report, uh, doing a live shot with Representative Tony Gon Gonzalez as these immigrants from Venezuela cut through or come through the razor wire right on camera. Watch this. Just as, as we're talking, you can see a gentleman is literally navigating, negotiating this razor sharp wire with a child. Every single day. And it's sad. It breaks your heart. I mean, the, the trek that these people have made, they should never have to make, have to start that trek down. He's leaving Venezuela for economic purposes. That the, 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 the situation in Venezuela is such a dire situation. And he's not going to qualify for asylum because he's, he's seeking economic persecution. That is not a, a reason to qualify for asylum. No, it's not a reason to qualify. None of these people, virtually none, has an actual asylum claim, but we're pretending. And by the way, Charlie, what we did when Title 42, the thing that let us keep them out, just saying COVID, 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 there'll be no asylum for you. We lifted it in May. And in order to like try to keep the numbers down, which worked literally for one month, we said, go through this legal process, download this app, apply formally. And then when you get here, we're gonna give you an ankle bracelet to keep track of you. And we'll go through the proper hoops all of that's out the window, all of it. Nobody's getting ankle bracelets. We don't have enough CPB. We haven't, we haven't the staff. We haven't the ability. We haven't the desire. So they're everywhere. They're in the United States. We will yes. never get our hands on these people again. There doesn't seem to even be a, a willingness to do it. And no. we've got you know, a president who can't understand the difference between black and Hispanic, who's calling people boy, who's tripping and falling. Like, I don't know if it's just a matter of incapacity to deal with the issue or just total unwillingness. But either way, we're actually, we're truly at a crisis level. I think they want it, Megan. I mean, they've said many times that they think that as, if they can make America closer to a third world country, it helps the Democrat party. And I hate to be that, you know, politically naked about it, but that's exactly what they've said. The Castro brothers have said it. Joe Biden even has said it. In that Hispanic speech where he confused blacks and Hispanics, he said that, you know, 26% of all kids are Hispanic and the American culture is Hispanic culture. And when I went down to Yuma, Arizona recently, the border patrol told me, Charlie, we are being told by our higher ups to facilitate the entrance of these people into the United States. And, you know, it's it's interesting, the, the gentleman that you showed on TV, television that came all the way from Venezuela, he's going to get a piece of paper to have some sort of court date for asylum. He's not going to show up. And so, yeah, no. it, his court date might not be approved, but he's just not going to show up. And then he'll just have another kid here and that kid will become an American citizen. And there you go. That person is there permanently. And so this is a deterioration of our sovereignty, the rule of law. And I mean, the, the excuses they make as to why to come into the country. Uh, and I, I mean, the Venezuela one, I do, I do find a little bit hilarious because Joe Biden recently just allowed 500,000 Venezuelans to stay here. So I say, oh, wait, so left-wing communism is a humanitarian health crisis? Interesting, got it. So, I, I mean, the other stuff they say, climate change and all that, the Venezuelan one, I actually have some sympathy because that's exactly what they want to make America into. They want to nationalize fossil fuels and get rid of them. They want to take away private property, take away the guns and turn us into you know, a third world dystopia. But Megan, I will just say, this is not incompetency. This is not their inability to govern. This is willingness. They want them in the country 
because either chaos makes them more powerful or they see a political future that helps the Democrat Party as America becomes more like a third world nation. You know how whenever you meet uh, somebody who's a naturalized U.S. citizen or is here on a green card from Cuba uh, or what have you, one of those one of those countries that was communist or socialist and they they fled and they got here, they're all Republicans. Like they get here, and they're like, oh, we don't want mm -hmm. executive overreach. We don't want the government telling us how to live our lives. I just wonder whether the Venezuelan thing is going to backfire on these Dems. Like they may root, you know how they, they want to keep out all the Cuban refugees, but they want to open yeah, up the border do. to everybody. I, I really wonder how that's going to work out for them. President Biden is like, that was the one thing he tried to say to the Hispanic caucus. He's like, look at me. I'm letting in all the Latinos. We have that. It's yep. soundbite six. Listen. We're significantly expanding legal pathways for entry so businesses can get the workers they need. Families don't have to wait for a decade to be together. I've also directed my team to make a historic increase in the number of refugees admitted from Latin America. Oh, it's historic. Unbelievable. It's absolutely historic. He's proud of it. He's proud of it. He wants them here and legal pathways. That means he's going to give amnesty to people that are border jumping and breaking into our country. And I have to keep on reemphasizing this. The asylum claims are trash. These people are not fleeing legitimate humanitarian crisis. OK, they it, could stay it, in Mexico. It, it's an insult. They could stay in Mexico yes, if it were a legitimate of asylum they claim. Can. Yes. And this is sponsored by the cartels. These people give their life savings as a form of human slavery and trafficking. And by the way, that video you're showing right now, Megan, I just have to say, these are fighting age males, okay? This is not, these are not families that are coming across. Every single one in that image right there are young men that are coming because then they're gonna send money back to the country that they're coming from, right? So they're going mm -hmm. to do, um, I, I believe it's called remittances, right? Where they send back tens of billions of dollars back to the country of origin. And look, immigration at times was an advantage to the Democrats because they were able to play on people's hearts and compassion and emotions. It is no longer an advantage for the Democrats because this is a question of order, a question of law, a question of standards. And the Democrat party wants complete bedlam. They do not want a border, period. There is no border right now that 10 million illegals will be in America by the end of Joe Biden's term. We consider that a disaster. Joe Biden considers that an accomplishment. And if, and future Democrat voters. Here's, uh, um, this right. is, I think, the Eagle, is this the Eagle Pass mayor uh, down in Texas, which has just been uh, overwhelmed. I overwhelmed. mean, they're, they're getting an entire city worth of illegal immigrants or so-called migrants coming into their city uh, a day. This guy's a Democrat, I believe. Listen to him. Does the president bear some of the responsibility I mean. for the crisis in your city? I'll be honest with you, I believe 100% he does bear some responsibility uh, for this crisis. I haven't heard from anybody in the administration. Uh, the president hasn't put out the state, a statement, the vice president, I haven't heard from anybody. Nobody has bothered to call me, anyone in the city staff saying, hey, this is the federal government. We know what you're going through. We're worried about you. This is our plan of action. Nothing. We're here abandoned. We're on the border. We're asking for help. This is unacceptable. Please just enforce the laws that are on the books. We're a nation of laws. This poor guy, he is a Democrat. He hasn't, yeah. he hasn't even heard from Vice President Harris, who, as you just pointed out, is supposed to be running point on the immigration problem. Nobody cares. They, right. they want it. They want it, and they're co-sponsoring it, and they're facilitating it, and it very well might be the federal government is co-sponsoring the largest child sex trafficking operation that we've ever seen. Megan, it takes 40 seconds at most to do a DNA test when a family unit comes to the border. 40 seconds, four zero, and we stop doing that. It's inexplicable, and we have, we have evidence after evidence that some of these kids are not related distantly to the people that are bringing them across the border. That's That's at the very least trafficking and potentially sex trafficking. But why would the Biden regime not do that? They've never had to answer for that. And by the not way, I just want to isolate. The rapes of the women that, that are happening down yes, uh, as which, they try. Which if, if you go down to Yuma, you go down to Eagle Pass, you go down to Hollis. I've been to many of those places. They have things called rape trees, 
right? I hate to be graphic, but this is where a lot of the women that go across the border are raped by the cartel people before they come across the border. It is well known in standard operating procedure where anybody, if, they're, if they tell their family, their friends that they're going to make the voyage to try to break into America, they give the women birth control and the day after pill to travel with across the border because chances are they will be raped along that voyage. This is not humane, Megan. This is not some sort of massive movement of people that want a better life. This is widespread immoral carnage. This is chaos. And the media is not covering it all. I mean, the media is, the, the, the most that they'll do is Aaron Burnett saying, well, do you think Joe Biden is at all responsible? Of course he's responsible. He's the president of the United States. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and then, then, I mean, then he's he like, well, Congress won't CD- do anything. Congress won't do anything. It's like, oh, you control just, the Senate. Your party it. controls the Senate. Like, who, who are you kidding? You haven't even tried. She you does. haven't led. You haven't pushed anything through. No, but what they are doing, and this is making people very angry, is Joe Biden is spending hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine, lecturing us about that invasion while we are being invaded. You could call it an invasion. I would. You could call it, you know, just a, a, a roar of people. You could call it a migrant crisis. Whatever. It, it is... It is our, it is the duty of our leaders to secure our nation before a foreign nation. And quite honestly, voters are starting to see like, wait, why are we sending all this money abroad for a no-win war while our own nation is being completely and totally overrun? And it is an insult to every single person that has come here legally. No, he's very worried about the security of the Ukrainian border and not at all about the security of our border yes. at all. This is That's why the, the support, and this was reflected in those polls we kicked off the show with, the support amongst all parties for what's happening in Ukraine is going off a cliff. The American people understand that we have priorities here at home. And while it's fine to say we can do both, that's been Vice President Mike Pence's message. We can do both. We can do both. Great. Then let's do both. Let's see that. We're not seeing that. So this is why people have had it. It's like, we appear to have limited funds and we appear to want to spend them to help the people of Ukraine and not at all the people of Texas or even the people of New York. And and sadly, what's happening now with tax dollars in New York is they're convincing the feds, okay, let's give us money or let's let's push through um, the ability for these, quote, migrants to work so that people who got here legally, who are waiting the six months before they can get any sort of work papers, they just Everybody else has jumped the line right in front of them. All the, all the people that broke the law go right in front of them. They take the jobs. And these people are like, what, are, what the hell am I following any of these rules for? And it only encur- encourages more people to cross the border. Now they're, now they're giving you work permits as soon as you get there. Now you can get a job driving for Uber as soon as you get there. We don't know who they are. That's There's right. an increased number of terrorist-linked people who now are gonna, what, pick our kids up in their Ubers as they try to get home from their schools that are packed with immigrants with 40 different languages being spoken. That's not America. So Corinne Jean-Pierre got asked a question about all of this at the White House podium. Here's how that went, SOT 5. How many people coming into this country illegally is enough for President Biden then? Say that last one. How many people, come, how many people illegally coming into the United States is enough for President Biden? Uh, well, enough point, for what? 5.9 million people have been I, encountered no, I know, illegally. I know the numbers, but enough okay. for what? Uh, enough just to stop the flood. As I mentioned, this is a problem that's been around for some time now, for decades, a broken system. I see. I see. So no, but oh, just at the smugness, though. I mean, like, honestly, I I, I won't say it. Get out of public life, Corinne Jean Pierre. I mean, just the attitude. Like, enough? What do you mean? And she knows what he's saying. She She knows exactly what that question is. And just the the attitude, the smugness, the self righteousness. I'll leave it at that. I, I could say yeah. more, but I won't. No, you're right. And I mean, and it's her boss. Like she's, you know, she's busy getting, doing her Vogue profile and worried about, you know, proving her bona fides as a black, lesbian, female, press secretary. Yeah, great, first great, one great ever. for you. The, the country's right. falling apart. Great. I'm glad you're black, lesbian, and on the cover of a fashion magazine. We got 6 million <laughs> new people and you're saying enough? Enough for what? Like you're some sort of 14-year-old taunting a teacher who asks you a question. Yeah, she knows very well. All right, let's talk about Bob Menendez because the story, I'm just, it's just, it's so, it's its alarming, but it's also pretty juicy. My God. So when this broke over the week, I'm like, wait, what? So they found Bob Menendez, a very powerful Democrat senator from the state of New Jersey. And uh, New Jersey, like Illinois, has all the corrupt people. I mean, I'm sorry, but like, all these I'm corrupt from lawmakers. Illinois. You are right. 
You are right. right. Yes. They come out of yeah. Illinois and they come out of New Jersey and then the, the people keep reelecting them. Um, Bob Menendez, after he sat for a federal criminal trial on his other corruption charges and got a hung jury, didn't get acquitted, but he got a hung jury. He was reelected. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so anyway, he get, apparently he, he's back at it. They're saying that as a sitting U.S. senator, he was cutting deals. He was helping Egypt, which was in a meltdown over the possible erosion of the $1.3 billion we give them in aid every year. And that outwardly, he was like, you know what? We may need to cut their aid. Egypt's got a hot mess of a human rights record. And, you know, I'm with my fellow Democrats who see this as a problem. But that behind the scenes, he was he was buddying up with some Egyptian meat seller <laughs> and trying to sort of grease the skids for the aid to continue and to make other benefits happen for this guy, among others. And that the, the feds, when they raided his home, found gold bars that they had watched the Egyptian guy actually buy one day. And then miraculously, they wound up in Menendez's house the next actual gold bars in his home in addition to the, the, the bills, like the, the series of unmarked bills found in his coat pockets, which were labeled Senator Bob Menendez. <laughs> Stupid ass criminal file. Like if you're gonna go to all the trouble of getting the, the bills, Charlie, you probably shouldn't put them in the Senator Menendez. This is who they belong to, just in case you were wondering, in Senator Menendez. And he's got a new wife, who is also now indicted. There's some speculation that the whole reason this woman may have married him could be to forge these alliances, because I guess she's relatively new. Who knows? But she's also indicted, as are several people around him, the Egyptian meat guy selling the kebabs. I don't know what's happening, but this is this is dark, Charlie. I don't think he's going to escape well, on this one. No, hey, oh, wait, all, I he, forgot he to say, and he's not stepping down. He's actually expected to announce his bid for re-election today. And he might win. It's New Jersey. <laughs> he he's gonna he's just gonna do the full Tony Soprano thing. So a couple of thoughts. First of all, Senator Menendez, we all know that if you want to sell out America and get rich, you just have your cokehead son do it for you. Okay, you got to have some sort of right. distance between Layer. your action and yourself. This this is really something. So Menendez gets off on a hung jury, and then he just dives right in to go be bought and paid for by the Egyptian government. My favorite part of the indictment, Megan, is when he Googles, how much is a gold bar worth? And how much is a <laughs> kilo of gold worth? And as you say that in the jackets that are labeled Menendez, they find cash all over the place. I'm going to be so interested just to hear his defense here. Oh, no, no, no. You know, my house operated as a temporary a gold depository for my friends. And, uh, you know, no, I just, no, I'll it, give it's you the safe, defense. you know. Here it is. Here it is. Late Friday. It is not lost on me how quickly some are rushing to judge a Latino oh, and push him out of his seat. Oh my that's goodness, that's so great. That's great. <laughs> You're all a bunch of racists. If you have problems with me having gold bars in my home and piles of cash, $400,000, and selling out my seat on the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee, you're probably a white supremacist. You know what? When you fail to win over AOC, on that defense, you fail with regular Americans. Here she is yes. responding on CBS's Face the Nation to that I claim. do believe that it is in the best interest uh, for Senator Menendez to resign in this moment. The details in this indictment are extremely serious. As a Latina, there are absolutely ways in which there is systemic bias, but I think what is here in this indictment is quite clear. And um, and I believe it is in the best interest to maintain the integrity of the seat. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, all people are, they must uh, be extended the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. I love how like she's speaking normally, she's from Westchester and then she's as a Latina, like, okay. No, I know. It's right. just so nauseating. Like, got it. Okay. I mean, as, as if you're, you know, you made the plight from Honduras, right? Got it. So <laughs> no, but, but it, it, there's a couple points on, I, I still believe though, that the indictment of Menendez is part of a DOJ effort to try to protect the appearance of impartiality as they continue their crusade yeah. against Donald Trump. 
I, I, they, they have to. It was so one-sided, Megan. The indictment of Bannon, right? The indictment of Douglas Mackey, all the January 6th stuff, that they were getting such pressure from Congress that they want to be able to say, hey, come on. We did the Hunter Biden gun indictment and Menendez were bipartisan. And of course, they pick a senator who had such ridiculously flagrant fraud. This is not a reach, right? This is not some sort of like, well, I wonder if we have the evidence at trial to be able to do this. I mean, you got the halal guy purchasing the gold bars. You have the gold bars there. You have emails. You got text messages going back and forth. And I just want to, I want to just say this. Menendez got caught. It makes you wonder how many other people in DC in both political parties are actively still doing this. They just might be a little bit more sophisticated and not such an idiot as Bob Menendez. You know, instead of taking the gold bars, maybe it's just, hey, hire my son or hire my cousin or my uncle and put them on this board. This, is what, what is the most alarming outside of the money and all that is that he was reconfiguring US foreign policy for bribery. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly only Joe right. Biden comes to mind as someone who has done that recently. So here's uh, just a little bit more uh, on what he is alleged to have done. Uh, they say the indictment lists several instances in which Mr. Menendez is said to have told his wife that he intended to approve arms sales information that she then passed on to a friend because they wanted they wanted the money for for arms sales. But there was a question about whether we were going to block them at on the committee that he was on. Um, and so he's saying to his wife, I'm going to approve the arms sales to Egypt, which Egypt would have been very happy at. Um, so then she then passed that information on to a friend, Wael Hanna, an Egyptian American businessman in New Jersey who owned a company that certified halal meat and who then passed that information on to Egyptian officials. So the wife goes to the meat guy, who's Egyptian American, who then goes to the actual Egyptian officials to say, you're good on the arms sales, don't worry. And that Mr. Hanna, H-A-N-A, -A, however you pronounce that, rewarded the Menendezes with cash, gold, and other bribes, according to uh, the prosecutors. And then they say that Menendez also Hold on, jumping ahead in, uh, let's see. In, in another indication of the importance Mr. Menendez held for Egypt, the senator met with someone whom the indictment describes as a senior in Egyptian intelligence official at a Washington hotel in June, 2021. The day before that official was to meet with other senators who were expected to emphasize the human rights problem with this guy. Mr. Menendez sent his wife an article that outlined the expected questions that this guy was gonna be getting asked by other senators which she then forwarded to another Egyptian official, according to the indictment, adding in a message, this way you can prepare your rebuttals. <laughs> and then they, then they say, okay, um, news reports from the Times show that Abbas Kamal, Egypt's intelligence chief, who's widely regarded as the country's second most powerful man, was visiting Washington that week when he was scheduled to meet with members of Congress. Two days after Menendez's meeting with the senior official, Mr. Hanna, the meat guy, went shopping for 22 one ounce gold bars, according to the indictment. Federal agents later found them at the Menendez's home. I mean, you really, you cannot make this stuff up. It's absolutely stunning. And so we'll see whether he withstands this or not. But I, I agree with you. It had to be to the point where it was this blatantly obvious, right? They had yes. really no choice but to look into him. But one does wonder, do you think he's the only dirty senator? Never mind if we expand it out to the House that's representing us right now. No, he was just sloppier. And I mean, just so flagrant too. And it goes to show that this guy obviously has, you know, some sort of strange psychological profile. Like, I mean, where yeah. he almost gets a thrill out of it, right? As if, as if it's almost more about the game than it is the reward, right? I mean, you have 400 and something thousand dollars of cash just stashed throughout your house. And after he gets out on an incredibly humiliating process on a hung jury, he says, I know, honey, let's go to the halal guy. I hear he knows the Egyptian officials because we need a bunch of gold bars and cash all over the place. And I say this with zero, zero sarcasm. He still might win re-election in the state of New Jersey. Oh my God, that is a nightmare. So Jeff Blahar, he writes for National Review Online. He's funny. He made the same point writing, okay, so the guy scored a mistrial on a hung jury 
And the feds then eventually dropped the case against him in 2018, just in time for him to be reelected to the Senate during a Democrat wave year. Other politicians might have exhaled in relief and thought, there but for the grace of God go I, and walked the line from that point on. Menendez instead apparently just got straight on back criming. That's exactly it. He was like, That's right. honey, we got the green light. Let's go. Let's do this thing. Yeah, it's exactly. Disturbing. And so there, there, there's something psychologically not not totally functioning there. I mean, and you see it as if he not, not only that he feels above the law, it's as if get, he, his purpose, his fulfillment was in doing something clandestine and illegal and kind of in the shadows yeah, that that is um, that's really really dark when you think about. I want to know more about because, the wife. I want to know more about her. Yes, why, why was she? Yeah, who there, involves their wife there. in their? You know, like why why is she contacting the meat guy? And they are, I guess, relatively recently together. I don't know. I just feel like maybe there's something going on there. Who knows? No evidence of that so far. We'll find out more as the feds pursue the case. Charlie mm -hmm. Kirk stays with us. Don't go away. Quick break, and we're back to CK. Just for a moment, let's push the politics and all the crazy news these days to the side and talk about dogs. Seriously, Delta Rescue. You may have heard of them. They're an organization that has dedicated their mission to providing lifelong care to rescued animals from the wilderness. Dogs, cats, horses too. This can be something everyone agrees on. Delta Rescue, providing for and protecting the animals we love the most. As humans, our relationship with dogs goes back a long way, horses too. And dogs have been our hunting guides, protectors, and sweet companions. They're part of the family. If all this makes sense to you and you love dogs and animals, check out Delta Rescue and consider making a gift. Delta Rescue relies solely on the contributions of people like all of us to provide care for life for their 1,500 plus animals. You can call them and ask questions and learn more about their super sanctuary and know that every gift counts no matter how small. It all counts please go to deltarescue.org today. That's deltarescue.org. So Charlie, um, Travis Kelsey has been in the news. Huh. He's a big football player. Um, I don't even know who he plays for. Is it Kansas City? There's two of them. Kansas City know. Chiefs. Okay. And he has decided to use his fame and power to try to push the Pfizer COVID vaccine on us. He went out there. Well, here's the video. Travis, did you know you can get this season's COVID-19 shot when you get your flu shot? Oh, two things at once. Two things at once. <laughs> two things at once. I'll have the uh, two things at once, please. Now back to two things at once. Two things at once. That's not two things at once. Mom. Travis, ask about getting this season's COVID-19 shot when getting your flu shot. Oh, God. Showing off his little Band-Aid. I mean, it's weird how there was no asterisks about, like, any of the significant side effects, especially for the young mm -hmm. men who probably look up to Travis Kelsey. Yeah, the question is, what will break his heart first? His new relationship with Taylor Swift or the COVID shot? That remains to be seen. So... <laughs> They, they, they're both are in the uh, business of breaking hearts. Yeah, look, I mean, it, he just did it for money, obviously. And uh, I mean, I used to be a really big fan of Travis Kelsey. And here he is trying to put a manly man spin on Pfizer. But this also goes to show how desperate Pfizer is. And you're trying too hard if you have to produce a advertisement like that. And by the way, you know, I, I watched for my NFL fo football yesterday. They ran this ad nonstop, nonstop propaganda. And you are not even allowed to mention the side effects or anything that happens with the mRNA gene altering shot that they co call the COVID shot. But, you know, this goes to show that basically anyone is for sale for a number big enough. Um, and let's also just say, Travis Kelsey, looking at you and knowing how you perform at a very, very high level, you're not exactly at a risk group to, for COVID. Why, why, why are you peddling this or pushing this forward? This is about profits for Pfizer, period, both for the flu vaccine and for the COVID shot. Me, like the stats show that if you are a 33 year old NFL football player, you are not going to die from getting COVID, period. But Travis Kelsey is for sale, evidently. And uh, I wonder how much. It really disturbs me because it's, it's, I recognize that the vaccine has done, especially elderly people, some good. But 
the people, there are, it's not the elderly people who are watching Travis Kelsey, Kelsey. My mom is not watching Travis Kelsey. It's young men who are looking up to him. And that is exactly the age group, those teenagers into their young 20s who are most at risk from to uh, of myocarditis from the vaccines and least yes. at risk from COVID. And so like, if it were me, like would I, as somebody who that group listens to go out there and push that vaccine? I wouldn't, I'd be like, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna find another product. I'm gonna push Subway sandwiches, or I'm gonna, I don't know, talk about weightlifting, or I'm gonna talk about sneakers. Or I'm, like, But this vaccine is, does he not know? Or do you think he just doesn't care? I, I don't know who he is. Um, you know, his judgment remains to be, you know, seen as far as he really knows how to make rational choices. I mean, he's a very successful football player and has been and earns a ton of money. But I mean, this is, it's disturbing because it's so obvious why Pfizer is doing this. I, in recent memory, post COVID, never remember enlisting NFL football players, A list NFL football players, to push forward a vaccine. Like, that's very, very strange and weird. Pfizer's stock is down. That is a fact. And they have to try to rally support to try and get the shot because they literally have vials and doses expiring in certain parts of the country because it's so, it's not popular. People know it and they don't want it. But you're right. The average demographic of who watches NFL football, especially who follows Travis Kelsey, is mid-20-something male. That, that, according to the data, according to the science from the CDC and the FDA, those are the people that need the shot the least, even if the shot were to work and did not have negative side effects, including the flu shot. So Pfizer is a profit-seeking enterprise subsidized by the American taxpayer. They're able to operate with legal impunity because of the law that was passed under Ronald Reagan that basically says you cannot sue vaccine manufacturers. And now they're able to use their excess billions of dollars of profits to hire A-list NFL football players and try to increase vaccine um like vaccine enrollment if you will this fall i i find it rather repulsive to be perfectly honest that a mm -hmm. supposedly alpha male person like travis kelsey is um is pushing a vaccine towards a demographic that doesn't need it not to mention i mean megan if i remember correctly you mentioned you know on an episode recently that the vaccine may or may not have contributed to an autoimmune issue i hear this every single day on yeah. how the yeah. gene altering shot has hurt people's health and we've never been able to have a serious discourse or dialogue on it. And you know what's weird? Like YouTube is probably in the process right now of adding its little weird addendum to our discussion right now for COVID yes. information, consult, which fine, YouTube. You know what, I, forgive me, Charlie, I'm gonna go very unchristian. Un and this is my response to YouTube. Sorry, it's a certain male gesture for those of you listening at home. <laughs> That's what I have to say to you. Go slap your dumbass label on my conversation, which is 100% more accurate than anything you're gonna see over at that dumbass website that you keep pushing people to. So, okay, I get an asterisk right. and you get an asterisk for having this discussion on TV. Tell it to my rheumatologist, okay? Tell it to my rheumatologist that there's absolutely, okay, I guess there's no vaccine side effects that we have to worry about. But Travis Kelsey, he's not gonna get an asterisk on his endorsement. That commercial can air everywhere asterisk free. Don't you worry. That's right. Don't worry about young boys getting myocarditis, getting severe heart scarring, according to Dr. Vinay Prasad, who's done amazing mm -hmm. work on this. He's absolutely credible. He's not some nutcase. He's not even controversial. He's been putting on pediatric cardiologist after pediatric car cardiologist. No, you can just put it out there, put it on the Super Bowl if you want, and with impunity. YouTube's not gonna slap any dickhead labels on that, sorry. I'm very not Christian at all. Male gestures and the D word. No, Sorry, Charlie, but it pisses me off. No, and, and Travis Kelsey should be shamed and humiliated for this because he obviously hasn't thought this through. People look up to him. And a lot there, if people follow his advice, the data shows that there might be some harm because of it. And not just myocarditis and pericarditis, developing autoimmune issues, but what is the upside? We're acting as if getting the virus is a killer. And the data shows that if you're healthy and you eat fine and you're not obese, 18 to 50, that with even mild interventions, you're going to be fine when it comes yeah. to COVID. This is sick care. This is the vaccine propagandists and manufacturers that are trying to put forward unnecessary interventions of inoculation when you say, okay, I had COVID, the antibodies are better than the vaccine, and I don't have to worry about myocarditis, pericarditis, 
or suddenly dropping dead at a football practice. Well, you know what else is going to happen? If you get myocarditis and you're stuck with this, I mean, it's not like heart scarring goes away just overnight and you're fine. It's that you're stuck with it. Mm -hmm. um, you could actually be compromised. There's been long studies about what, what that does to you over the long haul. I mean, the worst risk, of course, is that it's fatal, but there are a lot of risks short of that. They don't have Travis Kelsey's $50 million deal to help with the costs of that care most of the people listening to him. You know, they're gonna have to deal with the side effects of this that weren't disclosed, that weren't highlighted, that were totally ignored. And then with the ongoing health problems that come from it, without his gazillions, not to mention if he winds up marrying Taylor Swift, who was there cheering him on, because yeah. she's super woke now and put, did yeah. this big push good, to good, good, register good voters that, over the pal. weekend. Yeah, good luck with that, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, they're not gonna get married. Yeah, I, I'm gonna say that you're you're not exactly proving that you make the best decisions, Travis. So uh, well, didn't didn't Pfizer he also endorse, Swift, endorse Bud quite a Light? Combo. Didn't he also endorse Bud Probably. Light? Probably. Like <laughs> obviously, he's super white woke. I mean, he's super woke. He's with Taylor. He endorsed Bud Light, like post controversy, and he's pushing the Pfizer vax. So there you go. Yet another football player who really want really 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 wants us to know his left wing politics. Okay, speaking yep. of left wing politics, I haven't gotten to this story and we must. Ibram X. Kendi's uh, Mr. Rogers. fake empire has collapsed. He's essentially been outed as a do-nothing potential fraudster as he's now yes. under investigation at Boston University. It is conducting the investigation into his Center for Anti-Racist Research after complaints emerged about not just the culture, but the financial management of all the money, says Seda Grundy, a BU professor who worked at the center, uh, quote, I don't know where the money is. I do not know what happened to it. And they can't get Kendi, according to the people who work there, to respond, to meet with them, to offer an accounting. And by the way, the university only began the accounting or the investigation once the paper um, got a hold of the story and uh, the Globe, the Boston Globe, contacted them and said, here are the 25, 50, 200 questions we want answers to about where the money is, how it's being managed and so on. And now he's basically just denying all the charges and asking people to look over here, look over here, nothing to see here. My favorite part of this entire story when it comes to Ibram X. Kendi is how Boston University treated him with kid gloves. And they come out and they say, well, it's the grant management practices. They mean the money is what they mean. And the treatment of the money and where did the money go? But also, Boston University writes this press release. It's very clear. They don't want to be called a racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Is that they say, we have a lot of respect from Ibram X. Kendi's work, and we hope these allegations aren't true. Ibram X. Kendi's entire life's work is around weaponizing the word racist, a word that he can't define, by the way, a remarkable clip, if you look at it, to try and make money. Jack Dorsey gave this center $10 million, the Center for Research on Anti-Racism. So this is all in the allegation phase. I would not be surprised, though, if the money went poof, away. Very similar to Patrice Cullors and the Black Lives Matter Global Network, where they bought a mansion for black creation. Maybe we, I hope we learned our lesson. I hope so. Yeah. Exactly. It's unbelievable. And, uh, you know, one by one, these sort of heroes on the left and these woke left wing causes fall. You know, you mentioned Patrice Cullors, BLM, Kendi now. We've seen it over and over again. Um, be careful. Be careful what, where you give your money because he has no experience running these organizations. He's got one experience, and that's fanning the flames of racism in America. Yep. That he does really well. Uh, taking your money and doing something valuable with it, something else. Charlie Kirk, thank you so much. It's great to see you. Thank you. You too, Megan. All right, Thanks all so of you, please come back. Tomorrow we're going to have Carrie Brajan Bowler here, and boy, is there a lot to go over with her. <laughs>